Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Richard Smith, and I'm the chair of the UK Health Alliance on Climate Change, which is an alliance of most of the medical royal colleges, College of Nursing as well, the BMA, the Lancet, and the BMJ. And we work to counter the effects of climate change and to encourage the benefits of change that will come to health. So we're going to be talking here today about how can psychiatrists uh, change their own lives, change their professional lives, and contribute to this tremendously important effort. And it's a great day for doing it because, as you're probably aware, it's Earth Day. There's also the very important meeting going on in the US that Joe Biden is chairing, encouraging all countries to really get serious about this very serious problem. So actually, it's a day of optimism, and often we're a bit lacking on days of optimism. It's also the year of COP26, which will be held in Britain, either physically or virtually, and we are very busy in working towards that. The College of Psychiatrists has submitted a proposal to be able to present at, the, uh, at COP26. So we're gonna hear from three speakers, and then we're gonna have about 15 minutes for discussion. Um, you can ask your questions using the Q&A, which you've probably done a million times after all this lifetime of Zooming. But we're going to kick off uh, with four poll questions. So let's have the first question, which is, I take steps to act on the climate and ecological crises outside of work. And so far, it's almost everybody. It's I can see the numbers changing uh, in front of my eyes here. So it's sort of 80% yes, 8% no. I don't know whether that's a very conscious no, and 12% say they don't know. Okay, let's move. I don't know what, let's move on to the next one. So there you are, you can see the results. It's 80% saying they do do something. And so that's, that's impressive how much you are the converted or whether that's true of all psychiatrists, we can't tell from this poll. Let's go on to the second question. So, yes, acting on the climate and ecological crisis should be part of my clinical role. I was on a meeting with psychiatrists recently where about 60% interestingly said it should be. And here at the moment, it's about 70% saying yes, 9% saying no. I, I wonder how strong a no that is. And again, there's about a fifth saying, I don't know. So 70% saying yes. I mean, I think that's interesting. I think it would have been very different five, 10 years ago. So nearly 70%, you can see saying yes, 9% no, and a fifth, I don't know. Right, let's move on to the next one. We've got four of these. Acting on the climate crisis should be a priority for the Royal College of Psychiatry. So not just one of the things the college does, but should be a priority. Again, it's about, it's hovering around 70% saying yes. Now it's going down a bit. Uh, something slightly odd about commenting on polls as they happen, but they settle down quite quickly. So here we have 60% saying yes, 22% saying no, 19% saying I don't know. It's maybe something we should pick up in the discussion at the end. So there you can see it, 59% uh, saying yes. Right, the fourth question. Acting on the climate crisis should be a priority for my clinical organization, which for most of you will probably be a mental health trust. So again, this was a question that was asked a few weeks ago and it's something like 95% saying yes on that meeting of psychiatrists. Here it's, it's about 70% so far. So it, again, it's, it's quite a big majority, 13% saying no and 19% don't know. So it's very similar. So yes, so three quarters, you can see, well, two thirds saying yes. Good, well, clearly there's, a, there's, a, there's an appetite here for taking action. So during this uh, webinar, you'll hear some ideas. So we're gonna hear first 
from uh, Fiona Godley, who known to most of you, I imagine, who is the editor in chief of the BMJ. And Fiona was one of the founders of the UK Health Alliance on Climate Change and has been very active in this kind of world for what, 20 years, Fiona? Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, when asked to give talks, I have two topics that are closest to my heart. Uh, one is climate change and the other is medical excess. And I find that if I uh, talk about one, uh, I get to talk about the other. Medical overuse, excess, overdiagnosis, overtreatment is, is one of the accepted drivers of climate change. Um, and climate change can be tackled in part by tackling medical overuse. And sometimes I find myself ending up uh, with, with, a, with a plea out of this argument for prevention that is public health prevention uh, rather than medicalized prevention. And I think that does have a lot of re relevance for psychiatry and mental health. So let me share my screen. I hope you can see that. Um, so I'm going to talk about what you can do uh, for the climate emergency uh, and talking about what's the problem, why does it matter, who cares and what you can do. Um, this is an attempt to illustrate how urgent this emergency is. Uh, the colour scale here represents the change in global temperatures um, from 1850 to, to 2017. And um, you can see that um, when people talk about the last year being the hottest in recent memory, what they for often forget to say as, as was the year before that and the year before that and the year before that. Another attempt to show the urgency is this um, spiral, which um, I'll see if I can make that bigger. Um, you can see that this is about global temperature change between 1850 and 2020. Um, and really what we're gonna be trying to do is to retain the global temperatures within that precious 1.5 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. Um, and as you can see, we are very perilously close to um, exceeding that precious perimeter of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, so here's just another figure showing the steep increase in global CO2 emissions over the past um, century or more. Uh, and you can see here um, indicated the major global events that might have uh, had an effect on CO2 emissions, Spanish flu in the 1918, um, and the two world wars, the oil shocks, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and then, of course, we've got COVID, um, the pandemic, and uh, the, the suggestion that maybe that will bring a, a decline in global CO2 emissions. But if so, it's very likely to be only very temporary. And here's a, a, another uh, chart showing again that historical growth in emissions of carbon dioxide and um, really showing what needs to happen uh, because carbon dioxide retains in the atmosphere so long in order to bring us down um, in a way that will keep us below that precious 1.5 degrees centigrade below our pre-industrial levels and how easy it will be for us to overshoot that, that figure. Uh, so why does this matter? Well, I think you're all well informed about why it matters. Floods, extreme weather events, droughts and famine, war, displacement, refugees are all things that we're already seeing around the world. Um, and um, we've got evidence or from an analysis of, from the National Bureau of Economic Research that suggests that if left unchecked, climate change could drive temperatures up to the point where they would lead to 85 deaths per 100,000 people per year by the year 2100. And that is more than are currently killed by all infectious diseases across the globe. And, and we've got two scenarios here. One is with moderate emissions and the other is higher emissions. Um, and it's about com slightly complicated by taking in some adaptation costs, which take into account um, the, the uh, beneficial effects of adapting to climate change. But you, but you can see a really, really imp extraordinary deaths due to climate change, which exceeds all infectious diseases. This, this uh, was done prior to COVID, of course. Um, and what we know in terms of things that are fueling uh, climate change, well, it's the fossil fuels um, and the added element of, of threat to health of, of air pollution. Um, and we know that there are also uh, very clear links between uh, high carbon living and damage to health in terms of uh, obesity, diabetes, uh, cancer, and also conditions such as mental illness and dementia. Um, there is also an ecological emergency behind this with rapidly rising CO2 emissions mirrored by trends across various ecological indicators. And this comes from the World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet report 
And you can see various things like the, the increase in domesticated land, that means less land for wildlife, tropical forest loss, we've got marine fish um, capture, we've got shrimp agriculture, a whole, a whole series of different ecological um, uh, factors being uh, damaged as a result of, of the, the, the increase in, in CO2 emissions around the world. Um, and what this leads us through is, is the idea of nature providing economic service that's estimated around $125 trillion. Um, and this is about biodiversity and how human actions have degraded large, large areas of the earth and the oceans. And just at the bottom there to emphasize the growing body of evidence showing that interacting with nature um, can maintain and promote psychological well-being, which is of course hugely important to psychiatry and mental health. So who cares about this? Well, lots of us have been caring about it for, for a long time, perhaps with le less impact than we would have liked. Uh, this is an article I wrote back in 2006, which caused rather a backlash at the time. People saying, you know, what's medicine? What's this got to do with medicine? Uh, we're not interested in climate change. We want to know more about beta blockers and um, hip surgery. Uh, but we've carried on, as have others. So 2012, uh, Tony McMichael and colleagues talking about the high risks, health risks from global climate change. The Lancet's done a wonderful job with its commissions. Um, Christiana Figueres, uh, at the time working in WHO, working with the Lancet on um, the, and, and producing this important quote that climate change is the biggest global health threat for the 21st century. A, a quote that uh, uh, Margaret Chan, a director general then of WHO, picked up. Uh, and really, really helped to, to, to focus minds. And WHO has continued with this very actively with its manifesto last year for a healthy recovery from COVID-19. Who else cares? Well, very importantly, the bankers care. They, they talk about trapped assets. They're saying that fossil fuels are really not something we should be investing in, even if in, only for financial reasons, um, and that we should be, people should be shifting their investments to um, in, in, um, alternative energy sources and that's something that I think the colleges absolutely can take a lead on and other other medical organizations. How can we integrate climate action um, in the recovery from COVID-19? There's been a lot of talk about this and this article talks about phasing out fossil fuels being able to avert about 3.6 million premature deaths related to air pollution alone. Um, this is a quote from a study in the public uh, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and that the economy um, also, the global action required to meet the 1.5 degree target is estimated um, to deliver economic benefit, huge economic benefits uh, by 2100. So what can you do? Well, we know that we've got, um, we've got COP26 coming along and uh, Britain is hoping to be an exemplar uh, in terms of uh, how we are responding and how we're showing international leadership. And I think one area we can be proudly um, showing international leadership is on the net zero uh, plan for the NHS, which um, Nick Watts is gonna talk further about in a moment. And I'm just gonna show a few slides from the really excellent report that launched the net zero campaign. And this shows the different sectors that where the NHS can have impact on reducing its carbon footprint, which is which is a really substantial contributor to our national footprint, as, as is the case for health systems around the world. And you can see the different parts of, of the, the, the way in which health services uh, emit carbon and the ways in which we could begin to try to reduce those. And here's another fantastic graphic, I think, which shows the complexity of, of um, if we wanted to, to um, to reduce our carbon footprint, the different elements we're going to really need to look at and, and the, the detailed approach that's going to need to be taken um, around uh, the electricity decarbonisation, um, digital care pathways, reducing anaesthetic gases, uh, travel to and from healthcare, the buildings, uh, reducing food waste and our supply chain. So all of those things are going to have to be looked at in detail. And briefly, just to show how one area can have a huge impact, this is um, inhalers and anaesthetic gases uh, that we can change to, to less carbon uh, emitting and da climate damaging uh, alternatives. Um, the Centre for Sustainable Development, uh, Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, um, has taken a, a really helpful role here in looking at this by specialty and across different aspects of healthcare. And I like this chart because it really begins to show um, this idea that a lot of that, that top blue arrow here um, is showing that high levels of chronic disease and unsustainable resource use 
and low value interventions is where we are at the moment driving people towards secondary care, but that we could achieve a 30% reduction, they say, um, by using lower carbon alternatives, smarter use of resources within existing healthcare systems. But if we then move to actually redesigning healthcare systems, um, to using uh, pushing much more resource into prevention, patient-centered care, leaner pathways, and transforming our health systems, that we could, they say, reduce um, our carbon footprint by 80%. And that's really where the, the real wins are going to be. They've looked at uh, sustainable specialties and you'll see that mental health is at the top of this list. So it's, although it tends to be uh, often seen as, um, you know, people often forget to talk about mental health. And I think it's really important that we put it right up there as they have done. The UK Health Alliance, um, Richard's talked about this, and that's a body which you already as members of the college or linked to the RC psych are, are members of. And um, we're really, really glad that that is the case. Lots of activity there, both in terms of uh, uh, linking up different specialty groups, but also um, policy uh, lobby, you know, campaigning for policy change at a national and international level. Um, and just to give Richard another bit of a uh, uh, because he's not actively speaking at this meeting. Uh, this is a blog he wrote when he got became chair of the UK Health Alliance, talking about the things that we as individuals and organisations can do to reduce our own carbon footprints, um, abandoning flying, uh, reducing the amount we drive, stopping driving to work, vegetarian diets, the number of clothes we buy. Richard told us that he earlier that he has had to find a shirt to wear for this uh, webinar, so he's clearly buying one shirt a year. Um, and measuring our own carbon footprints and, and generally talking to other people and joining organisations so that we can lead change as individuals. And then um, as an individual within your organisation, here's my summary list of what we should be doing. Uh, becoming informed and sharing information, getting involved in how our organisations are responding, uh, getting our organisations to disinvest from fossil fuels, um, and to declare a climate emergency, it might seem a small thing to do, but actually surprising uh, the impact of that. Uh, reviewing our own carbon footprints, uh, sorry, reviewing our own clinical pathways and waste management. And, and Lisa will talk more specifically about what psychiatry can be doing on that, on that score and leading by personal example. So although it's a grim subject, I think we have to look on the positive side. There's a huge amount we can do. There's a huge amount that is being done. And this is the year to do it. Thank you very much indeed. Marvellous thing. Thank you very much. Um, I want to reassure you that this shirt is 20 years old. I yes. certainly don't buy one shirt every year. I find a shirt lasts me at least 30 years. Right, well, Fiona talked a little bit about what the NHS is doing, and now we're going to hear from Nick Watts, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of the NHS. And before he talks, maybe I should emphasise, if you look, unfortunately, at a chart in the Lancet countdown that Nick used to run of what is happening to the carbon footprint of health systems across the world, they're almost all going up which is clearly slightly crazy when this is the major threat to health in the world today. And NHS England is genuinely leading on this. So Nick, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks everyone for having me. Hi, uh, lovely picture of your feet there, Richard. Um, uh, it is going up, you're, you're right. If you, look at, um, if you look at emissions across the world from, uh, from the healthcare system, uh, globally, they're rising. They've been rising pretty steadily, um, roughly on average, just a little behind what we're seeing sort of uh, economic averages of emissions rise rise at. Um, one or two countries that are uh, that don't have rising emissions. One of them is uh, is is England. Um, the NHS emissions in the NHS, depending on how you calculate it, you must always be very careful when someone tells you. Uh, numbers of emissions reductions because baselines matter and scopes matter and trajectories matter. Um, between 26 to 63 percent reduction against a 1990 baseline, 26 percent reduction for the entirety of all of the emissions you could possibly imagine, both terrestrial and beyond, uh, in the United Kingdom and beyond, 63 percent uh, for the emissions that occur within, physically within uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, impressive. I don't think there's any other system that could. Um, that could claim that. I'm able to say that without sounding too arrogant, I hope, uh, because it didn't have anything to do with me. I'm new. 
uh, all of this happened from from ex some exciting, some impressive work that was there from the leaders before uh, before us. Um, the NHS has cared very deeply about climate change for quite a long time. Um, 2008, the Sustainable Development Unit was set up uh, world first in response to the Climate Change Act charged with decreasing the emissions of a healthcare system. Crazy idea. Fiona has already talked about some of those health impacts, that quote from the Lancet uh, Commission 2009, climate change is the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. Margaret Chan did echo that. The other thing she said is climate change is the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. Doesn't get much more extreme than that, does it? From a director general of the World Health Organization. <laughs> Couple of reasons why the NHS would care about climate change. Firstly, we're told by the director general, it's the fifth, it's the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. But there are some serious health impacts that come from climate change. Around the sort of two degree mark, you expect to see a six fold increase in the severity of extreme weather events in the United Kingdom. You expect to see shifts in uh, patterns of tick-borne encephalitis, fibriosis. You expect to see marching across Europe, uh, shifts in, in the vectors that carry, in the mosquitoes that carry um, all sorts of nasty things, Aedes aegypti uh, carrying yellow fever up through, up through Turkey. Um, those health impacts are dangerous. They are worrying, and, and this picture up here, it's taken, I think, from the sixth floor of Skipton House, uh, should remind us why, why we care. Because the purpose of the NHS is to provide high quality care for all now and future generations. And there's an enormous body of literature that states very clearly, you simply can't do that. You cannot provide high quality care for all now and for future generations unless you respond to climate change. So that's the first reason why the NHS might care. The second reason, uh, is we have to put our hands up and say, hey, we're a bit of a part of the problem. 5% is that number that we saw. It's been going up a little bit, 4.6% for the NHS um, to be a little bit more precise. Uh, that doesn't sound like too much, but let me convince you it is. Uh, that 4.6% for the NHS, roughly the size, if I go and find a country in Europe, roughly the size of the entire country of Denmark or of Croatia. Approximately 40% of UK public sector emissions, 29% of all electricity consumed in the country is consumed within the NHS. Uh, sorry, within the country's public sector is consumed within the NHS, let me be careful. And that 10 years of work that the Sustainable Development Unit that I'm sure many of the people on this call have been doing to respond to climate change, that has taught us a few things. It's taught us, firstly, that, the, that it's possible that you can reduce your emissions whilst delivering high quality care. Secondly, that actually it helps. A lot of the things you wanna to do to respond to climate change, it turns out they are just common sense, public health, medical interventions. They improve public health, they increase system efficiency, they improve your bottom line. But the other reason, the other thing we've learned from those 10 years is that people quite like it. Patients don't complain when you deliver care sustainably. Patients actually have a better experience overall. And when we go out and poll every year, NHS staff again and again and again, 1.3 million of us turn around and say, nine out of 10 uh, want to see the NHS acting more sustainably in a more environmentally sustainable way. So that's the why. You can look at this, Fiona had the, had the graph up before. It gives you a very quick snapshot of where the carbon is in the system. Uh, everywhere is the short answer. Um, it focuses around activity. You can see that, uh, that chart over to the right there with the bubbles. Um, focuses around acute care, focuses around sort of pharmaceuticals, medicines within primary care. Um, this is terrifying that carbon is everywhere. It's not just a problem with LED lights and inefficient building heating. Uh, it's something that is in everything we do, in the medicines we prescribe, in the cutlery we use and our patients use, in the way that we get to and from work. So that's a little terrifying, but it, it should also be reassuring. Reassuring because that means if there's carbon everywhere and if we're all a little bit responsible for it, then we can all act on it. Every single individual in the NHS has one thing, two things, 10 things they can do to reduce their emissions. And that I think is uh, empowering. So we've talked about why. This is a snapshot of the NHS's emissions and its footprint. The what, 
uh, how are you going to, what are you going to do to deal with this? Well, the NHS is going to become, we think, we hope, the world's first net zero healthcare system. Pretty ambitious. Probably something only the NHS, a system like the NHS, could put its hand up and reckon it could have a crack at. The NHS provided, uh, was the first universal health system to provide universal health coverage. First, I think, combined lung and heart transplant, world's first mass vaccination uh, campaign, in fact, the world's first COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, it's right, it's uh, fitting, it's appropriate, it's no surprise that the NHS is the world's first healthcare system to commit to net zero emissions, and we think we can be the first to get there as well. 2040 for the emissions we control directly, 2045 for our entire scope, not just the things that happen within the four walls of a hospital, but our entire supply chain. Companies outside of the country, uh, companies a long, long way away. Uh, we wanna know that when we do business with our suppliers, we are doing business with people that are, share our values that are heading in the same direction as us. It's the why, it's the what, how, uh, this graph gives you a rough sense of, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 interventions that we are thinking about. If you go and take a look online, you'll actually see that behind each of these is another 10, and behind each of those 10 is another 10 again. There are so many things that everyone can do to respond to climate change within the NHS. I like, rather than grouping it into confusing colors that make it impossible to read on slides that are a little too complex, I like to group it for myself into three things. There are the no regret things, kind of the things that they won't happen for free and they won't happen by themselves, but uh, electrifying the transport system in the United Kingdom, I bet you 10 years from now, we are going to be seeing electric vehicles absolutely everywhere. They will be the norm. In fact, by 2030, a uh, new piece of legislation heading down the road uh, will ban the sale of new uh, the sale of new diesel and petrol cars, you'll only be able to buy new electric vehicles. That sort of thing is kind of going to happen. There's a good market for it. It's good for health. It reduces air pollution pretty significantly. Um, there are other no regret interventions. Uh, you could take all of the lights in the NHS, none above me, one there, uh, and replace them with LEDs. That would cost a little bit of money, not quite as much as you, as you might think, 100, 110 million pounds upfront investment. Um, but it would pay itself back in spades in about two and a half years. You would start to get ROI back on that. Um, those are those no regret things that we should just get on with and do. Then there are some things that are a little bit trickier uh, because they start to interface with um, almost clinical ways of operating, right? Um, ambulances. I said people are gonna solve, I said an economy is gonna solve for us and with us uh, uh, zero emission transport. And we think that's probably going to happen. And we're going to have to do our part with the, the leased fleet and the owned fleet of the NHS. But no one is going to solve a zero emission ambulance for us. It simply isn't the global market for that kind of intervention, which is a little daunting, but also kind of exciting because it means the NHS gets to solve that problem. We get to be the world's first uh, health system to have the world's first zero emission ambulance. So we're working with some of our suppliers that produce the current ambulances. We think we will have a prototype. Hold us to account. Um, if we miss the deadline, don't be too upset, but hold us to account. We think we'll have a prototype of a working zero emission, fully hydrogen ambulance ready to go in time for COP26. And then a second follow-up, an electric hydrogen hybrid uh, ready the following year. Those kinds of things that only the NHS can do. Ambulances, uh, our supply chain. I talked about those commitments to, to our suppliers. Uh, Yes, there's a lot of things happening in the world on climate change and, and the summit today uh, online and over in the White House uh, showcase some of that. But there are parts of the economy that the NHS uniquely touches on the pharmaceutical sector, for example. Um, there, we have said very, very clearly, the NHS will no longer purchase from people that don't meet or exceed our commitments on climate change. That's a pretty strong statement. Uh, give us a decade. Within the decade, the NHS will no longer purchase. That's because it's a little bit difficult to figure out the analytics. But we think we can figure that out soon enough. And when we go and talk to our friends at AstraZeneca, uh, when we talk to the med tech industry, when we talk to the tech industry at Microsoft, um, the, the response isn't, what are you talking about? Are you insane? The response is, fantastic. Can we go faster? How can we help? 
um, this is a trajectory that I think we are all heading on. Uh, and yes, it's going to be a, bit, a few bumpy, uh, bumpy roads along the way, but I think we feel pretty good about how quickly things are moving. So the how includes those no regret issues. It includes uh, only something at the national level as big as the NHS focused on healthcare system can do. But then it includes uh, those 1.3 million staff that make up the NHS. In some ways, our biggest asset, right? That's the thing that gives me a little bit of confidence that this almost insane trajectory down, plummeting down in emissions is possible because you get 1.3 million people to do it again and again and again, and it interfaces with absolutely everything, uh, everything clinicians do. Um, that's why the Royal College of Psychiatrists is so important. That's why the British Medical Journal is so important. That's why the UK Health Alliance on Climate Change is absolutely pivotal because without all of our clinical staff engaging, there's absolutely nothing we could do by ourselves. This isn't something that can be solved by some aberrant Australian sitting somewhere in London. Um, it, needs, it needs quite a bit more energy uh, than that. To that end, uh, we're going to help, we think, um, we're going to start launching some staff engagement campaigns. We are going to start going out to regions, to systems, to trusts. Um, we're going to start asking people to make commitments, personal commitments, ward level commitments, hospital level commitments, the kinds of things that they are doing not in five years, but in the next month. Um, and we're going to start competing. We're going to start to see who, uh, who can reduce their emissions a little bit quicker than, than who else. Um, we're also going to start funding uh, and give it 10 days, give us 10 days, you'll start to see tweets and emails and announcements of uh, some new net zero clinical fellowships. 10 to begin with, uh, double that uh, going forward. We're going to take uh, leading clinicians in nursing, in the allied health professions, in medicine, take them and place them with the national clinical directors, with the national medical director, the chief nursing officer, the chief allied health professional officer, um, give them the opportunity to say, hey, take that care pathway, cancer care, um, mental health, net zero that at the national level and then work across regions and systems to bring that down to the local level as well. Um, there's so many infinite things that we could do. We have a long list of things online that you can go and take a look at. You will read it and say, that isn't everything. Surely you could do more. Um, and you're right. There's always going to be more we could do. And there's always going to be more that I think we're willing to sort of revisit, pivot on, um, think through, and then get to work on. In some ways, I don't care which of the things people go and do, whether it is some of those no regret options, some of the things that only the NHS can do, or some of the things that require all 1.3 million of us. Um, all I really care about is that people do one thing, that people every day wake up, think about this and change one thing about their own life, one thing about their own clinical practice to start to deliver uh, what we hope is gonna be the world's first net zero healthcare system. Thanks very much. Good, well, thank you very much. Uh... Nick, I mean, that's interesting about, I didn't know about these 10 net zero fellows, that's great. And maybe some of the people who are listening to this call will be interested in applying for that. Uh, I urge all of you to use the Q&A to ask questions. The more questions we have, the livelier our discussion can be at the end. But we're now gonna hear specifically about uh, mental health and psychiatry from Lisa Page, who is the chair of the College Sustainability Committee. Lisa, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Richard, for the introduction. So my name is Lisa Page and I'm a liaison psychiatrist based in Brighton. And I'm also one of the college's associate registrars for sustainability. So I'm just going to share my slides, bring them up and then we'll get started. Okay, so I'm hoping you can see, um, see these slides. So, uh, following on from Fiona and Nick's talk, I'm going to focus on why the climate and ecological emergencies are topics for psychiatrists and why we need to engage with them. I'll briefly reiterate the importance of these emergencies that you've heard from Fiona and outline why they don't just have environmental implications, but also far-reaching implications for human health, including, importantly, mental health. 
I'll then talk about what the college is doing in this area, and then I'll finish with how we as psychiatrists can approach this in our day-to-day -day work. Okay, but first a quick quiz question. Who is this man? Any ideas about who he is or why I've put him up, why I've put a picture up of him? Please post your answers in the chat. I will give you one clue. He is a psychiatrist, um, but we won't talk about him anymore now. We'll come back to him at the end. So I'm going to start by reiterating the critical nature of these twin climate and ecological emergencies. So if we take climate change first and look at the graphic on the left hand side. So this is showing the so-called um, tipping points. Um, and we think there are nine important tipping points um, that have been identified by geographers and climate scientists as being of critical importance in the next few years. And these are sort of points of no return, whereby once these tipping points are flipped, they're likely to be sort of non-linear and cascade effects that in turn lead to the release of even more carbon into the atmosphere or a lack of sequestration. And then there's a really significant environmental destabilization. And earlier this year, Johan Rockström, who's one of the world's sort of foremost planetary scientists, um, climate change scientists, conceded that um, three of these tipping points are very likely to have been crossed already. And these three are the melting of the Arctic summer sea ice, the melting of the West Antarctic glacier, and significant um, dieback of tropical coral reef systems. Um, so further crossing of these and tipping and these other tipping points really are going to lead to very significant environmental change and, and unfortunately very massive effects on human health. And in terms of the ecology of the planet, we're losing habitat, soil, species at an unprecedented rate, such as the such that human activities thought to be uh, responsible for what's being termed the sixth mass extinction. So it's not an exaggeration to say that we are facing twin planetary emergencies, and these will have impacts on human health. We have a critical decade ahead of us, um, and we have no option really but to act, and to act quickly if these impacts are to be managed. So I just wanted to remind everyone of the UN's current uh, sustainable development goals, which were published in 2015, and note that several of these highlight the need for access to green space uh, to optimise human health. For example, goal 11 states that um, this goal uh, should be to provide universal, or one of the sub goals is to provide universal access to safe and inclusive green spaces. And they particularly highlight that for disadvantaged groups, which might well include our, our patient groups. Um, and of course, there is ample evidence of the, of the link between accessing green space and mental well-being. And this has come very, very much to the fore over this past year of COVID. And many people are now aware of the need to get out into nature in order to manage their mental health. And that might be to prevent mental ill health, in, mental Ill health or it might be to actively manage existing mental health problems. So the planetary nature of these twin crises have been recognized for nearly two decades as having profound impacts on human health, as Fiona was outlining. But the distinct mental health impacts have been more challenging to identify and quantify. Now, of course, physical health impacts in themselves are intimately linked to mental health impacts, as we've seen in COVID. But I'm going to review how the climate and ecological emergencies are already affecting people's mental health, both here in the UK and overseas and how these impacts are going to accelerate in forthcoming years. So one way to think about these impacts is as direct and indirect. And if we start with the indirect effects, we know that changing weather patterns in the global south are leading to changes in land use, forced migration, and even conflict. And by the end of 2019, the UNHCR estimated that nearly 80 million people were forcibly displaced, um, 50 million of whom were internally displaced within their own countries. And these large scale changes to people's ways of life and family structures result in migration, urbanization, and, and obvious and major implications for people's mental health. And these social changes particularly impact the elderly, children, women, and other vulnerable groups such as people with mental illness. And if we look closer to home, we can observe the indirect effects of climate change on the levels of emotional distress amongst some children and young people. And certainly my CAMS colleagues tell me that this, this type of material is frequently preoccupying and worrying to the young people they see in their work. So turning to the direct effects, um, these are in some ways easier to quantify. 
And as global warming increases, we're already seeing more weather-related events occurring, flat floods, storms, droughts, wildfires, and so on. And there's now ample evidence that these impact on people's mental health. And these can stretch from, these impacts can be transient mental distress through to increased prevalence of depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use disorders. And some of these impacts, for example, flooding events in the UK have been shown to have really long, significant and long lasting impacts on the exposed population that, that can last for years. We know that heat and heat waves have adverse effects on mental health outcomes, including um, uh, suicide and mental health admissions. And we know that um, heat particularly impacts the morbidity and mortality of people with pre-existing mental illness. Many infectious disease experts believe that zoonotic crossover events are directly related to how humans interact with the ecosystem and the animals within it, as exemplified by COVID and Ebola. And one thing we can be sure of is that existing health inequalities experienced by people with serious mental illness and substance misuse will be exacerbated as climate change and ecological change progresses. And, and we've seen that inequality, uh, haven't we, in the um, impacts of COVID. So I'm in no doubt that all health institutions must respond to the climate and ecological emergencies. And you've been hearing about NHS England's response, and now I'm going to turn to what the Royal College of Psychiatrists has done to date and is planning to do. Well, first to highlight that our president, Adrian James, and our registrar, Trudy Senevaratni, were both elected on platforms of sustainability and have been actively prioritizing how the college should respond to the climate and ecological emergencies. And last summer, in order to gain as much information as possible on this, um, the college ran a series of roundtables with various experts, stakeholders invited to um, tell us how climate and ecological change is going to and is already impacting on mental health, but also the solutions we should be looking at uh, as it related to the work of college members. And this work has informed a college position statement on the climate and ecological emergencies, and that's going to be released um, in a few weeks time at the beginning of May. And that will set out the actions that the college will be taking over the next few years. And I hope give a roadmap as well for, for members. You may or may not know that the college divested of all its fossil fuel investments in February, 2020, and instead reinvested in a portfolio that aligned to the UN sustainable development goals that I showed you earlier. And at the last count, um, this had saved the college nearly a million pounds from where it would have been had it not divested. So a real good news story. And the college, um, this, work, this work that the college did, it was one of, one of the first, but not the first college to divest, has, has certainly encouraged um, and led other colleges to, to do the same, to have the confidence to do the same. The college has submitted four separate applications to COP26, and we're waiting to hear what representation we'll be able to send to Glasgow in November to speak about the impacts of climate change on mental health. Uh, the college's children and young people's faculty has been actively addressing these issues in their conferences and in their college publications. And the college also supports a thriving sustainability committee, which meets regularly and has a range of work streams, including a joint piece of work we're doing with the Royal College of GPs to better measure and manage the environmental footprint of prescribing. After all, 12% of drugs prescribed in primary care are psychiatric medications, often prescribed for weeks or months, um, or sorry, for months or years, I should say. And so our prescribing choices in secondary care have really important implications, of course, for our patients, but actually for the environment as well. We've got three sustainability scholars or green scholars currently working on projects, um, including a CAMS advocacy project, a horticultural project and an active transport project. Uh, we've put together web resources for members wanting to work sustainably within their trust. We've published guidance on social prescribing, green walking projects, choosing wide, wisely, which is a, a international effort, eco distress, and uh, we're also able to input into curriculum reviews and the CCQI uh, networks. So I want to spend my last few minutes looking at what sustainable and planetary friendly mental health practice looks like. And the first thing to remember is that sustainable healthcare is also good quality healthcare, and it aligns surprisingly well with other drivers in the NHS, such as the long term plan. So we can go back to these basic principles, which uh, have come from work done by the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. And these are that we must focus on prevention. The most sustainable thing we can do is keep our patients well, uh, which might mean, for example, intervening early before people are in crisis. 
We also want to empower patients and staff along the way. And we want to provide high value care, which in other words means providing the right care at the right time at the right place. And along the way, we can reduce the carbon impact of our services. And we can particularly do that if we're aware of carbon hotspots and if we know um, how, and we're, after all, as clinicians, probably best placed to work out where we can lose um, carbon and where, where there are inefficiencies in the way that we're using our care pathways. So in terms of what you can do in your workplace, whether that be a mental health trust or otherwise, first of all, find out if your organization has a green plan. These are also, or formerly were known as SDMPs. Most trusts do have some form of uh, plan or program of work, and it can sometimes feed, or it should feed into board level. So very often these green plans are very focused on estates, um, but it's hugely welcoming of clinicians with new ideas about what to do. And it can be a really powerful way to effect change in your trust if you get involved in your trust green plan. Have a look at other strategies that your organisation is implementing and see where there are synergies with mitigation of climate change. For example, any digital transformation um, initiative that your trust is implementing uh, you know, and you're interested in that, get involved and look at it from a, a, sustainable, a sustainability perspective or look at the reworking of crisis plans if that's going on in your, in your trust. If you're going to do a QI project or supervise one of your juniors to do one, why not undertake a sustainable QI project? For example, project on implementing social prescribing within a team or medication management on an inpatient ward or working with catering or meat-free or locally sourced options. Um, and there's a myriad of those types of projects that, that you could um, look at. And why not write to your chief exec and ask them whether they've declared a climate emergency? And if they haven't, why haven't they? So here's that psychiatrist that I introduced to you at the beginning. I'm just going to have a quick check and see if, oops, um, see if I can work out uh, whether anyone's named him. Uh, I don't think anyone has. Apologies if you have and I've missed it. Um, but um, he's unlikely to be on this webinar because he's based in Switzerland, but his name is Bertrand Picard, and as well as being a psychiatrist, he's um, an explorer and I suppose you would say an activist. And in 2016, he was the first person to ever circumnavigate the globe in a solar powered airplane, and he did it nonstop. And this was called, uh, his plane was called Solar Impulse. Um, and it certainly wasn't easy or a quick thing for him to do. It was, I think, his third attempt at actually doing it before he succeeded. Um, and he didn't do it because he thought it was then going to become a mass transportation system. He did it to prove a point and to show it could be done. And that if you have a vision, you can fulfill that vision if you, if you, keep, if you keep working at it. And he now runs an organization that promotes green, clean, but importantly profitable technology solutions around the world. So I'm not saying that Bertrand has all the answers and neither do any of us on the webinar today, but I'd like to think that we can all take a leaf out of Bertrand's book and be ambitious with our work in this area. Because ultimately what's good for our planet is good for our patients and it's also good for us. So thank you very much for listening um, and I look forward to hearing the discussion. Good. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's good to hear that the college is doing so much. I mean, the College of Psychiatrists amongst all our members is, is one of the leaders. Right. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. So let's kick off. So Vinod Rao is asking, can remote working and home working be incorporated formally into the climate change initiative? So let me ask you that first, Nick. You're on mute. There, yeah, you're unmuted. Who are you asking first? I didn't I'm hear. asking you about whether remote working and home working can be incorporated formally into the climate change initiative. So into your plan. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's already there. We um the NHS is thinking pretty seriously about uh that a lot of the thinking that we have here, I suppose, is um on sort of home working at the moment is either for elective. Uh, recovery plans or it is for sort of primary care or it is for uh, people within NHS ENI. Um, a few bits and pieces of plans out there. I, the, caveat I, the caveat I would have there is all of that thinking is at the moment sort of there but on hold in the back of your mind because we need to make sure we have a proper understanding of what the implications of all of this working from home have actually been, make sure that we do it right, do it purposefully, do it in a way that actually uh, you know increases staff well-being. Um, you also have to be a little bit careful 
because I could be disingenuous and I could tell you that because we had shut down our offices and pushed all of our staff out to their homes and had them working from home throughout the pandemic, the NHS's emissions for its offices had plummeted. Sort of, sort of, but there was still a home back there that was being heated. Um, there were still uh, lights in those homes that used to be off that are now on. Um, and so you need to be a little bit more expansive in how you think about um, the emissions attached to that, but, but absolutely digitizing and, and using sort of those digital solutions to bring some of this closer to closer to home, I think is one big part of that solution. Right, and somebody else, the asks about conferences and you know that uh, the medical world is very fond of conferences, massive conferences. You've written about that, can they be? Oh, yes, I think, I mean, it has to be an enormous potential saving on travel and, um, and uh, you know, conference halls and all the kind of waste that comes out of packed lunches and then and, you know, all the detail of how, how conferences are run and marketing screens and everything. But um, and my own view is that actually Zoom works brilliantly and you can have quite large numbers of people on Zoom and here's a webinar happening now. Um, there's obviously loss and the lack of face-to-face -face, um, interaction will, will be a loss. But my own view is that the benefits outweigh those losses and that we should move to largely online conferences um, and just find other ways, you know, maybe there's gaming technology or other ways with avatars that we can try and interact digitally. I just wanted to add the point though, that we must not forget that digital um, activity isn't carbon free. And, that, you know, we have to rather like Nick is saying, we have to take into account lighting and heating in people's homes. We have to take into account the, the carbon footprint of digital uh, activity. And Lisa, can I ask you about, I mean, a lot of psychiatry is conversations with patients. Can more of that be done online, do you think? Yeah, so a lot of our, lot of our teams have gone, um, you know, virtual, fully virtual pretty much over the pandemic. And I think, uh, I think it really depends. This is where the, the sort of um, working in your own locality and in your own trust and in your own teams really comes into it. Because, I mean, I'm a liaison psychiatrist. We, we, we dabbled a little bit with some digital work, but we, we, it wasn't right for my specialty or in our team, at least. So, um, so we, we don't do it. We, we probably won't do it um, because we're working in an acute hospital. But for community teams, sure. And if you're working in a community team, you know best how that works. You also know, hopefully by now, what's lost by doing that and, and the implications for patients who do need to be seen face to face. So I think it's all about working in, um, in, in faculties in, um, and in, you know, as far as the college is concerned and in teams and within your trust um, when it comes to the solution that's going to be right for your team. And, what, you know, as I said, the, you know, the digital transformation was a big part of the NHS long term plan. So have a look at what your trust is doing in that direction anyway and how it meshes with this. Well, Lisa, leading on from that, and I'll come back to Nick with this as well, uh, Dazal says, any suggestions for ways of engaging our organisation to take this important work on properly rather than box ticking? Our trusts often have many competing pressures with sustainability often slipping into the background. How can you make sure the trust gets active? Well, I think um, making sure the chief exec is um, aware that there are people working in the organisation for whom this is really important. Um, getting involved with the green plan, as mentioned, um, and seeing where the green plan feeds into. And if it doesn't feed into a high enough level, why is that? Why doesn't that happen? And I think just keep um, keep going, keep advocating. And I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure as this becomes more, it's just such a topic in in general, in the news, in general conversation, there's a, a, so much awareness of it that I, I don't think uh, chief execs and boards can fail to uh, start grappling with it properly. So Nick, you've obviously got to think about that. You're going to have them competing with each other, are you? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, ask, ask your hospital, ask your trust, do you have a green plan? Absolutely, it should mirror the ambition of the net zero report, right? Net zero is where we're heading and it should be that ambitious. Uh, they should also have a net zero board level lead. It's a new requirement we're building into standard contracts going out to the NHS. They won't have one just yet, but tell them to start thinking about it. Um, every trust should have a net zero board level lead to oversee some of this. Uh, the thing I would say to respond to that question, maybe taking a step back though, is something that came out of, fell out of the analysis we did in 2015 with the Lancet Countdown. Um, 
the response to climate change is not a technical question. It's not an engineering question. It's not an economic question. It's not a financial question. It is entirely a political question. It's a communications question. So if you're not getting traction, build up your power. Go and find some friends, shout a little bit louder, get a megaphone. Um, uh, that's how you start to grow that attention, I think. Okay, here's a tricky one for you, Fee. So how radical can we be, asks an anonymous person. Perhaps the BMJ and the British Journal of Psychiatry should be available only in online versions. Yeah, I think that's a very, I think we should be radical. Um, I mean, we, Richard will know this having been previously editor of the BMJ. Um, there, there are commercial reasons that make such decisions difficult, but I don't think they should stop us making them. I, I, hot off the press is the news that we will shortly be signing um, the uh, pledge on climate change as a publishing group to become carbon neutral by 2040. We would much hope to do that earlier than this. Um, and the big con contributor to our carbon footprint as a, as a publishing house is the print BMJ going out weekly to 120,000 doctors. We're very, very conscious of that. And we've done as much as we can within the current technology to, to be carbon friendly, climate friendly with the paper, with the wrapping, with the way we distribute it, but it's not gonna actually cut that carbon footprint substantially. So the, 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 the plan is we move as fast as we can on digital development of apps and, and online provision. Uh, we really need the advertisers to move over to digital um, and that's what's stopping us stopping the print as well as people liking the print. I mean, that's the other thing people do like print still. So um, it's definitely on the cards. Um, I think when you were editor, Pete, uh, Richard, we talked about five years. How, how many years did you think print would last when you were editor? <laughs> used to say five yes. years time? Anyway, <laughs> yes. 20 years or no, how long have I been? 16 years on. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's on the cards, but exactly when? And I don't know about the BJ Psych, but who could speak for the BJ Psych? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the BJ Psych to think about that. Here, here's a tricky one that maybe you could go first with, Nick. Um, just in case people didn't notice it, when he referred to an aberrant Australian, you probably guessed that was Nick himself. This is rather a moving one, really. I'm a psychiatrist belonging, it comes from Suresh Papelia. Um, I'm a psychiatrist belonging to a low resource country. Its capital recently ranked the world's most polluted city. Living in the UK and practicing psychiatry, I feel guilty that I'm not doing enough. In fact, I moved to the UK because I felt very distressed that nothing was being done to prevent CO2 emissions in my country. What do you think I can start? What do you think I can do to start work in my country towards preventing pollution and climate change? Nick, yeah. hard question. A very difficult question. Um, this space is evolving very rapidly. Um, one of the big, big problems, and let's be very clear about this, globally we have is when you go and look around at which countries have active healthcare professions uh, talking about this globally, um, it's not in the countries that have uh, the populations that are most affected. Now, I suspect that's because they're probably not, they're probably too busy doing their work down at the national level to, to reach up and you know, bother talking at the global level. But there is a lot more that needs to happen um, to build up health professionals across uh, the rest of the world, outside of just Australia, outside of just the United Kingdom, outside of just Canada, um, uh, and that small little island at the bottom of the world that no one particularly cares about, New Zealand. Um, uh, the important thing attached to that though, and the reason it's so important, is because that's where the majority of the future emissions are going to lie. Now, what we need to make sure we do is the NHS absolutely needs to go first. The United States, uh, Australia needs to go first. And we need to demonstrate that there's a good, sensible, possible way to do this. Um, but there's also a heck of a lot. We, we're actually learning quite a lot from a couple of health systems. Um, Apollo Healthcare down in India, a couple of health systems down there about what you can do to reduce your emissions. There's so much that we can learn from uh, low-income, middle-income countries that are also working on this. The Aga Khan Foundation has just started to do some really impressive things with the WHO on low-carbon healthcare. Um, we're gonna steal all of that learning um, and try to implement it here. I wanna put this question to both of the, you, Lisa and Fiona, you first, Lisa. I mean, the College of Psychiatry, presumably, of psychiatrists, presumably you've got a whole global network. Can you help in that way? Yeah, we've got lots of overseas members, actually, and it's something that the international membership is, is you know, really interested in. And when we, you know, had their involvement in the round tables that I spoke about. Um, so, yeah, I think the I think the um, the college is 
is interested in reaching out and but as Nick said actually also receiving intelligence about what's happening in you know in other countries particularly the global south um you know it's difficult isn't it because the because those countries that are going to be affected first have the least kind of um implication in causing this um and yes although emissions there in many countries are in global south are going up um they're nowhere near what what we've produced in in you know western mm. europe and north america um, to date so i think the responsibility does lie with um developed countries such as the UK first. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it's work we'd like to kind of progress actually at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And Fiona, a quick word from you, because it's time to finish really. I mean, you're, you're read across the world. Well, I think, I think that um, the big, big contribution we can make is to support doctors and, and, and public health professionals and seeing this as a really core part of their role. And, um, and the more we can talk about, you know, the, the crucial importance of this to health uh, and, and allow doctors to, to, to magnify their voice, which is what the Alliance is doing in the UK. But I think, you know, just encouraging people to come together and, 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 and magnify the, the health voice in policy decisions around the world. I, it's, a, it's a really important thing. And I think it can make a difference. Good. Well, we're, we're going to have to finish there. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. And I think all of you... Uh, listening and watching this you've got many ideas on things you might do so you can't do everything at once but I urge you to think about what you can do later today or first thing tomorrow morning to make a difference so thank you very much and I've no doubt we'll do some more of things like this thank you bye bye bye, -bye.